you got your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. It's been a common um, theme this morning and this week to reflect upon what God has, has done for us. It's been a common theme this morning as we've sung these songs to reflect upon God's amazing grace in our lives. Where would we be if it wasn't for Him? Where would we be if it wasn't for God pouring out his, his grace upon us? And knowing where we would be and knowing what God has done for us is going to help us to be who God has called us to be. When you find out who you are, not who you are before you came to faith in Christ. See, that's who you were. And then God came into your life and he saved your life by grace. Then he says, this is who, who you are now. That's what you need to understand, what your identity is now, in Christ Jesus, that's when you're going to be victorious. But we have a battle. We talked about that this morning in Sunday school class. It is so hard not to necessarily to discern between the Spirit of God, the, 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 what God desires, what Christ would have, and the, and the flesh within us, because we know what sinful desires are, right? As believers, we've been born again. We've been made new. We have a new heart. We have a new spirit. So we can, we can easily tell what's of God and what's not of God for the most part. The problem is it's a struggle, isn't it? There are things in this world that catch our attention, that get us off the purpose of God that, that he has for us. This is who you are, Josh, but there's things in this world that grab at my flesh, don't they? the things that tempt us, the things that you left behind to follow Jesus but are still out there lingering in this world that catch your attention. That's called what? Temptation. And I don't know about you, but since I came to faith in Christ, temptation didn't go away. It actually got stronger because I'm fighting against it, trying to follow the Lord, trying to walk by the Spirit, not gratify the desires of the flesh, but there are still desires of the flesh, and I'm tempted to get distracted, to get derailed off of God's purpose for my life what he saved me and redeemed me for, and what he wants me to do now that I am in Christ. Things also become discouraging that will derail us from what God has for us, don't they? You look around and you are trying to walk by the Spirit. You are trying to live for God. And when you live for God, being rooted in him, being grounded in him and walking in him, then you start trying to walk this thing out and start fulfilling his purpose, that great commission for us purpose to glorify God to fulfill his purpose his plan to go and make disciples of all the nations and as you try to do that and you live in a world that's not trying to do that that's not just not trying to do that but they're actually opposing the work of God it becomes discouraging it makes you want to stop it makes you want to quit oh Lord we're coming in home where the streets are golden right you start looking towards that heavenly home and forgetting that we have a worldly mission that we have to, a kingdom mission that we have here in this world to reach people for Christ so that they can find that hope. We've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son, and we've got a mission here before we go home. And we've got to remember that, church. It's so easy as an individual or as a local body of believers to get distracted and to get discouraged and to get derailed off of what God has for us. But the purpose remains the same, doesn't it? God says, devote yourself to me in gratitude. Live your life for the glory of God. That's what he wants for us. And so one of the ways in which we do that is we remember God's amazing grace. One of the ways in which Paul is doing that for these, uh, these believers here in Ephesus, these guys were saved. I was reading that again this morning, how they, they took their books of magic and they burned them and threw them away because they turned to the living God, the true God. They repented. And they want life in Him and they want His purpose for them. And he says, I didn't hold back from teaching you all of the stuff, all of the truth. I didn't hold back any of that in fear. I gave it to you so that you may walk in Him. And they turned to Him, but they're still living in that pagan society, right? The same way, it's a lot like today. We're becoming more and more like it was uh, back then, and the persecution is fixing to be poured on, and we need to be ready for that. How do we do that? We keep our eyes on him, and how, how do we stay the course? How do we continue to do it? He says, remember who you are. Who am I, right? And who, who has he made you to be? Paul turns their attention in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, let me tell you, not so much, yeah, I'll tell you who you are. You're a child of God, called, chosen, 
elected before the foundation of the world, predestined to be His. That's who you are. God came after you by His own grace, by His own mercy, to make you His own, didn't He? And He purchased you with the blood of Christ. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace that you hopefully just sang with a sincere heart, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a, a wretch, every one of us, like me. Who am I, right? He just sang about it. Well, let me tell you who you are now. You're a, a man who's saved by God's grace, called, separated, put in Him, in Christ Jesus, paid for by the blood of Christ, and then He sealed you with the power of the Holy Spirit. He sealed you with His Spirit. You're His, not just now, but forevermore, you're His. What does that tell you in Ephesians chapter 1? Don't get bent out of shape about it. What are the theological nuances? It tells you that God is for you and who can be against you. He's been for you since before the foundation of the world and He's for you right here and right now, church. And so they ought to feel that backbone strengthening up, right? Because it ain't about me anyway, it's about Him. And He says, well, let me tell you another thing. Think about where you were before God decided to come after you. Think about it. Think about where you were, what your spiritual condition was. What was the reality of your spiritual condition before you came to faith in Christ, before you were saved by God's grace? And then think about this. If you really consider that terrible place you were at, then you can really grow to appreciate that wonderful thing that God did. This is what He did. This is where you were. This is what He did. And this is what He did it for because He created you for this reason, for this purpose alone. So when we think about what He did for us, when we think about where we were, what He did, and what He desires for us, we ought to be living with that overflow of gratitude and joy in our hearts for what He's done for us. We ought to live for the glory of God. Every time you get discouraged, every time you get distracted, think about that. I hope, just stop. Think, think about this. Where were you before you came to faith in Christ? Has anything changed? Has anything changed in your life since you say the God of the universe saved you, gave you a new heart, gave you a new spirit? Since you say, I repented of my sins and I put my faith in Jesus. Oh, if you don't understand, if you're not moved with that, then maybe, just maybe, you don't understand the gospel. Because it's a black backdrop with diamonds thrown on top of that, isn't it? It's a black velvet backdrop with beautiful diamonds where God comes in and He shows you His amazing love and His amazing grace. If you will constantly reflect upon that, preach the gospel to yourself every single day, then ought to move you. His love for you ought to move you for a love through life and not get down and out. You're not going to go through life and not sin. You're not perfect. That's why He had to come and save you. But he did give you a new heart, and he did give you a spirit. He gave you a mission to fulfill while you're here, whether that's here in Jackson or in Boston or anywhere else. He gave us a mission. And so, church, we've got to reflect upon what he's done for us. The song that has continued to come back to my mind this morning, I promise you I have been in tears four times this morning. Tears. I don't, you know, not, not, it's not saying nothing. Cry a lot. We will remember. We will remember. We will remember what? The works of your hands. And we will what? Stop and give you praise for what? Great is your faithfulness. He's not just saying God's just up there a faithful God. No, God had a plan that he put into motion and God fulfilled that plan and you're part of that plan. He saved you, redeemed you, made you his own. And then when you stop and remember that God was faithful to what he said he would do in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that he's going to send somebody to crush the serpent's head. He was faithful to that, and therefore you can live because he lives. We will remember the works of your hands. Man, when I go through that, I, it just it brought me to tears this morning several times. And so this is where I want to take you this morning, where you were, what God did, and what we're supposed to do. Why did he leave us here? It's simple. I always quote this verse. I've quoted this verse so much that I thought I preached it before, but it doesn't matter. We need it again, right, if, even if I did. It says in verse 1 of chapter 2 of Ephesians, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too, all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest stop. In those first three verses... We were, by nature, children 
of wrath. Not just you, church in Ephesus, but all of you. This is your spiritual condition. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have not turned from your sins and trusted in Jesus, this is where you still are. And if you have turned, this is where you were. If you're trusting in Jesus today, this is where you were. He says you were spiritually dead in need of new life. This is the reality of the condition in which you were in. You were rebels. You were sinners. Because that first man, Adam and Eve, the first human beings created to love him, to serve him, to glorify him forever, to live within the boundaries that God gave them, to enjoy his presence, to rule over his creation. Just don't step outside of the boundaries. I am Lord, you are mine, rule over my creation in that order, right? I want to fill this world with my glory, be fruitful, multiply, image of God bearers throughout the the, the earth. People who worship God, that's what he said. What happened? Adam stepped out of that boundary, didn't he? Adam transgressed that boundary. Adam and Eve sinned against God, plunging this world into darkness. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 that sin entered to the wor- into the world through one man and death came through sin. Therefore, he says, because all sin, death, we all experience death, right? That's what he's getting at. He says, we are sinners by nature. Does that make sense? We don't, it's not like a dog. A dog is, is, is born a dog, right? And then one day it barks. The, the moment it barks, we don't go, hey, that's a dog, right? No, you know it's a dog the moment it's born. The Bible tells us that we're born in sin. We get it mixed up sometimes. Sometimes we think, oh, that sweet little innocent baby, it's so, it's so cute, so cuddly, and then one day it just, oh, man, it made a bad decision, and there, then it became a sinner. But the Bible tells us the exact opposite. You inherited that sin from Adam. The Bible says in Psalm 51, 5, Surely I was sinful from birth, but not just there, sinful from the time that my mother conceived me, is what he says. I was born in sin because we all come from Adam and Eve. We're born in that fallen, sinful state, following our sin, following our self, following, ultimately, it says here, Satan, following this world system, following the desires of the flesh. Why? Because it's within our hearts. We follow what's in our hearts. And the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17 that our hearts are desperately sick. Who can understand it? And so the things that the sweet little baby, <laughs> when it's born in this world in a, with a fallen nature, it's not that one day it becomes a sinner. It's that one day it starts manifesting what's in its heart, which is self, self, self. Wah! Right? If you don't know, you're going to know. <laughs> I don't wish harm on anyone. <laughs> but you're going to start seeing there's self-centered nature. All of us, we can all look around and say, all of y'all are selfish. That person's selfish. I don't care how wonderful they are, how giving they are. Everyone within their own heart is selfish. We're born that way. The baby's born that way. It just manifests itself a little bit as it goes, sometimes in crying, and then it gets to mine, 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 mine. Be ready. He says we're sinful from birth. What does it mean? I'm calling you a rebel. I'm calling you a sinner. I'm calling myself a rebel. I'm calling myself a sinner. What does it mean? You are dead in your transgressions and in your sins. So transgression is that boundary has been drawn. Don't step over this line like Andy, uh, like, like the dude who was trying to fight Opie. Don't step over this line. You step over this line, it's going to be on. Don't step in this circle, right? There's a boundary there. Opie did what? He stepped into it. I knew you all like that. He stepped over it. What did he do? He transgressed that boundary. What is a sin? A sin is the idea of missing the mark. Anybody shoot in here? (laughs) They're all outside, guarding the parking lot. (laughs) All of them. You're shooting at something. You're shooting at a mark, whether you're shooting a bow, an arrow, you're shooting a, a pistol, you're shooting a rifle, whatever you're shooting. If you're shooting spitballs in class, you're aiming at the teacher. You're aiming at something. That's your mark. That's what you're aiming for. Sin is the idea of missing that mark, right? You're missing that mark. That's what sin is. Well, what's our mark? Mark is perfection. You serve a loving, a kind, a righteous God, though. You serve a holy God. He says his his mark is perfection. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, but you're filling the earth with my glory. Always glorifying God in everything that you do. Fill the earth with worshipers, not self-centered people, but God-centered people. That's what we were created for, to love him, to serve him, to worship him, and to enjoy his presence forever within those boundaries. Jesus says it this way in Matthew 5, 48. He says, be ye perfect, for your heavenly Father is 
perfect. Why did he tell them that? Because they can reach it? No, because he needed everybody in that audience, everyone who was within the earshot from him to understand that whether you're a peasant, pagan, sinful, tax collector, sinner, or whether you are a self-righteous Pharisee, every one of y'all do what? Fall short of the mark. We can all stand up in this room and I can tell every single one of y'all, there's not a single person in this room who can jump up and touch that ceiling without help, without a trampoline, without something. I don't think a trampoline will get you there. But if I said, everybody stand up, everybody get up, right? No, don't do it. And I say, jump up like, like y'all did the other day for that picture. I say, jump up. Some of y'all got higher than the others. Every one of us can jump at the count of three and all of us will fall short of touching that ceiling without help, and that's exactly what he said. That's where mankind is. They're sinful, they're rebellious against God. They've all, Romans puts it this way, all have sinned, missed the mark, and done what? Fallen short of the glory of God. They have missed the mark by falling short of God's perfect standard. The glory of God is living your life to glorify God. And not a single person has done that perfectly. If you think you have, read the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And think about the person you fight every single day. Think about the one you fight every single day. You fall short, brother. You fall short, sister. I fall short every day, and I need God's grace. So all of us have sinned. We've all missed that mark. We've all fallen short. And he says we're living for our sin. We're living for ourself. And it says that we're living for the lust of the flesh. We're living ultimately as followers of Satan. That's where we were. Because who was the first rebel? It was Satan, wasn't it? Who was the first one that said, I don't want you to be the Lord of my life? It was Satan. And he elevated himself in his heart and in his mind to try to be what God was, what God is. He got outside of those boundaries. And when we do that with our lives, which everyone has, then what do we do? We're ultimately following the same example of the evil one. And that evil one is the one who's swaying this world system that we're living for now, that's catching that flesh, that's catching that that, that's tempting you to serve yourself rather than serve God. So this is where you were. You were following the ways of this world, following your own flesh, following your own heart, following your own desires, and you were sinning against your God as you were doing that. When you chose to live for you rather than live for him, he says you are sinning against your God. You were rebelling against him. I don't care how good your perfect purpose is. If God says do this and you say, but this is a noble deed, I'm going to do this, it's still called what? rebellion and that's where all of us are some of us get closer to the mark than others i miss it by a mile but all of us have sinned fallen short of the glory of god and all of us are basically going down a stream it's like a river going in this direction and he says according to ephesians chapter 2 and other places he says that we are happily going down that stream we're actually swimming down that stream with it going according to the course of this world You know what he also tells us? That we love our sin. He says in 1 Peter, as he's talking to, I believe it's 1 Peter, he's talking to, uh, let's just say chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3, it says, For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles. You've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans do, is what he says. Having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. You're following the ways of this world before you come to Christ. That's what you were doing. That's what the world is doing now. And loving your sin. I've been on both sides of this. And I, and I think that many of you have too, been on both sides where you can understand. Some of y'all came to faith in Christ so early, it was so natural that you started following your Savior because you grew up around the Word of God and you grew up just starting to believe. That's a wonderful thing. But I remember a time when I was separated from Christ before 26 years old, and I remember that time going, you know, I'm a Christian because I had this intellectual understanding that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the grave. I believed the gospel. It was true, right? And I lived my life for myself. And I used to think, why are these Christians, I'm a Christian too, because I believe that, why are they not like, diving into the wild living that I'm doing? It doesn't bother me at all. It shouldn't bother them. Why are they not getting drunk with me? 
Why are they not having these wild parties with me? Why are they so concerned about what the Bible says? I just don't, I, we're all saved by grace, amen? <laughs> I've been there and then I gave my heart to Christ as an imperfect, sinful person at 26. And the next day I'm kind of like, ah, I love Jesus now. I want to start following him. So as I started following the Lord, falling short, falling on my face constantly, as I'm trying to walk with the Lord, I look back and I see my friends who say, yeah, I'm a Christian, saying, why won't you come with us? Why won't you do this anymore? Well, something's happened in my heart, man. I can't explain it. All I know is I was here, this is what happened, and now I'm here. And I'm looking back and saying, that's not what God desires for my life, and that's not what I signed up for. I signed up believing that he was my Lord and believing him that he was my Savior and believing that I, apart from him, can do nothing. I can't save myself. I can't walk with him unless I stay close to him by faith. Storing up wrath, he says. Following Satan, he tells you this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. It says, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Like, we look around, we can't really tell what's going on with a person. Well, John, who was the inner circle, Peter, James, and John spent every waking minute with Jesus, our risen Lord, and then was the last one to hear from him before, right? He, he wrote Revelation. The last, the close, one of the closest followers, the beloved apostle says, hey, it's obvious who are of the devil and who are of God. Whoever does not practice righteousness. It doesn't say whoever does not perfect righteousness. It says whoever is not walking with the Lord, it's obvious, that's what he says, is not of God. Now, I'm not going to argue. I'll argue with you guys all day. I'm not going to argue with John because uh, it's the Bible. And so where are you on that side of the equation? It's all that matters. Because it doesn't matter what I believe and it doesn't matter what you believe. What, it does matter what you believe. But you, it, it's, John has said this. God has said this. Are you practicing wickedness or are you practicing righteousness? If you're practicing wickedness, that's where you are. If you're practicing righteousness, you have been saved by God's grace and you are beginning to walk with the Lord. Amen? Come on. That's what the Word teaches. And so it's a good thing to examine our hearts. And if, and if you're still saying, who am I? And I'm a child of, of the enemy and I'm, I'm in rebellious, I'm rebellion against God. He says that you are still storing up wrath for yourself on the day of judgment. This is harsh. This is hard stuff. It's just truth, though. It's because it's where we are and we don't even know that we're there. I didn't know I was there. I knew deep, deep down that God was speaking to me and that he wanted me to come to him. But I didn't, I didn't believe that I was lost because grace. But I was lost, y'all. Because I was walking according to my own self and refused to come to the Lord who saved me by his grace and said, come and receive this. The Bible says that if we are doing that, friends of the world in that way, John 4, James 4.4, 4, you adulterers and adulteresses. He's not talking about physical adultery, physical adulteress. He's not saying you people who cheat on your husband or cheat on your wife or look at this stuff when you're not supposed to be looking at that stuff or premarital sex or any of that stuff. He's not saying that. He's saying you people who follow yourself rather than follow God, who follow this world instead of following God, spiritual adulterers, do you not know that friendship in that way with the world where you're living for yourself and you're living for the world, do you not know that that is enmity towards God? He says, if you are living in that way, you are an enemy of God. I don't know, that's another, there's no other way to put it. You're an enemy of God. He says it here in Ephesians 2, you are an object of what? An object of wrath is what, in verse, go back to verse 3, it says, and we're by nature, and you were born this way, objects of wrath. You are storing up wrath for yourself, Romans 2, 5 says. Because of your, your stubbornness, and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself. I, I was a, I'm afraid of horses. <laughs> I don't know them very well. Every experience that I have, one of them bit a friend of mine on the leg. I saw it, and it was terrifying. He came and just, it was tough. But, but seeing the stuff on, on the cartoons, right, where you walk by the horse, and it, it kicks you, and then you go flying, and you're out, you know, and got these stars around your head. I was terrified of them. I go out to my buddy's, my mom's friend's place out in Utica, and I'm going hunting, and I was like 16 or 17 years old. I had this dog, this old mutt, and I knew that he was going to come. He wasn't a mutt. He was a lab, but crazy. 
he, I said, he's going to mess up my hunt if I don't do something with him. He said, just go put him in my shed. It's all good. I was like, cool. So I walk over there to put this dog in the shed, and I didn't know the horse feed was in the shed and these, like, 55-gallon drums. And so I kind of opened the door, and I didn't realize it swung back closed whenever you open it. So I walk in there with my dog, and I'm trying to get his stubborn self situated. I'm like, stay. I'll be back in an hour and a half, two hours, whatever. And then I look up, and I see Mr. Ed sling the door open. It's a, it's a horse named Solomon, I mean, uh, Samson. Samson, get that. Horse named Samson, and there's one way in and one way out, and I'm terrified of horses. And so this, he slings his head, you know, through the, I didn't know, I thought he was coming after me. He's coming after that feed. And so he starts backing me in a corner. I'm like, turn around, turn around, turn around. And he's like, just kind of doing his little gums. You know how they do? And so I look, and I realize, oh, well, I'll just give him what he's hungry for, right? So I start feeding his flesh. <laughs> I start giving him like like they used to do at the petting zoo, and it starts, you know, taking it. I'm like, get away, and it wouldn't turn around. Watch this. The master came home. He came in there, and I see his head popping. He goes, what on earth is going on here? I said, I don't know. This horse just came after me. I'm always supposed to be tough. I'm trying not to cry. <laughs> he was, that horse was so stubborn, refusing to turn around, refusing to go out. Even the master came up and said, get out of here, Samson. Get out of here. And he's just fighting against his master. You know what that's an example of? That's an example of us following our flesh, following ourself, refusing to, this is the word, y'all, repent. Stubborn, unrepentant hearts is, I'm going this way, I don't care what my Lord says. And the way in which we're saved is by repenting and turning back to our master and saying, we're coming back to you, and the only way we can is if you save us by your grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. So some have said, I'm saved by grace through faith and has refused to turn back to the master. That's where I was. He says, because of your stubbornness, I'm going my way, not yours, God. I don't care. I hear you calling. I'm going my way, not yours, God. And your unrepentant unwillingness to turn like Samson, not the, not the guy in the Bible, but you see what I'm saying. Because of that, you're storing up wrath. We're born in this situation we're loving our sin, loving ourself, continuing down this path, storing up wrath for ourselves on the day of judgment. And he says he's appointed a man once to die, and after this comes judgment. And God could actually bring that judgment at any given time. We are objects of his wrath. So think about this for just a second. We're like out here as sitting ducks with big targets on our back, every single person in this world. And God, if he desired to do so, he could be completely just and righteous to take his hand of mercy off of us and allow us to slip off into an eternity separated from God in a place where the worm dies not and there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He can do that to us in any given moment. He could have done that. I was talking to Ishmael and Maurice, two of my buddies. I took one of them out to eat. You get the other one. And no, Ishmael and Omar, sorry. They come out to eat with me, and I'm telling them this. I'm like, I'm going back through my testimony. I'm like, I should have been dead I don't know how many times when I was walking in my stubbornness and my unrepentant heart and the mercy of God kept me alive that entire time. He could have any moment said, okay, fall off the top of that truck if you think you're Teen Wolf. You know, some of y'all get that, some of you don't. Okay, get shot down at the bar fighting. Okay, get cut in the neck while you're down there at that other one fighting. Okay, I mean, because it happened. He could have taken his hand off of me and I could have perished for eternity, and he would have been completely good, righteous, and just to do that because he's a holy God, and I'm a rebel against him. But what does the Bible tell us? The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some uh, understand slowness, but he's patient with us, not wishing that anyone should perish, but for all to come to repentance, for all to turn around like that horse finally did, as the master was pushing that horse, get out, Samson. Samson finally goes, all right. And he turned and he started going the master's way. And then I was like, whew. I, it, was, it was a wild night. But he turned. He finally turned. And that's what happened to me. But I was storing up wrath. I don't want to be the, 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 the object of anyone's wrath, let alone a, a, a holy God who created everything. But he loves us so much that he does not allow us to perish he allows this world who spits in his face. He allows this world who curses his name, who drags it through the ground like a cuss word, right? He allows them to live. Every single breath is a gift from God. 
for those who are perishing and for those who are not perishing. And we ought to be grateful for that. It's, uh, it says that you're locked in this state. Sinners separated from God, going your own way, right? But you're locked in this state because he says you are at the very beginning and you are dead. You were, excuse me, he's talking to the church. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. In other words, you did that and you didn't even realize the state you were in. I've seen a lot of dead people working as an EMT, working as a firefighter. I jumped off of the truck on many occasions, did CPR on a dead body. The things that I remember, uh, two things I remember the most, never, not one time did a dead person holler out and say, I'm back here in the room, come find me. Unaware of the situation that it was in, unaware of the condition it was in, it was gone. It needed an external source to come in and grab, right, and to help. It needed a rescuer to come in and help, and, and it, it was unable to help himself in that way. Never once did the body say, all right, you, I'll hold this bag, and you give me chest compressions, or I'll put the pads on to shock if you'll just do the chest compressions, if you'll do the bag, if you'll push the medicine. Never, never. It was just there and needed, completely dependent upon an outside resource, rescuers to come in and find them and get them and work them and pray to God that he would give them life. Seen it happen once. It was amazing. The rest of the time, unable, unaware. It's like this. Ezekiel's dry bones. You know what I'm talking about? God takes Ezekiel, takes them out to the valley of dry bones, shows them the dry bones that represent Israel who's gone astray. They've already messed up tremendously. Deserving of God's judgment. Dead. Helpless, hopeless. Very, very dry bones, by the way. He says, son of man, can these bones live? And what does Ezekiel say? Lord, you know. <laughs> God, you know, because apart from God, it's over. There's no hope. They're helpless. They're hopeless. No signs of life. There's no way unless God himself does something that they are going to find life. And that's the situation that all of us were in before God redeemed us. That's the situation that this entire world is in, locked in that condition, loving their sin. There's a world out there that don't even realize how lost they are and don't even realize that they're one breath away from spending eternity separated from him. We know it don't we? We should know it. It's where we were. But then you have these, he says, that was you and you were dead in your trespasses. But then he comes in, those wonderful words in verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. God stepped in. That external source, right, came in. Man couldn't save himself. Man was hopeless, helpless, unable to help himself, unaware of his sinful condition until God himself initiated and came after us. He says, you missed the mark. You've fallen short of the glory of God. You don't live to glorify God. You don't let, and who can save you? No one can save you because all of you are unrighteous. There's not even one of you who are not corrupt on some level, right? We're all together, become corrupt. None of us seek God, so you can't help yourself. So what does he do? He sends his son to come and to seek and to save that which was lost, to find us in our deadness to find us in our spiritual condition. We're lost, we've gone astray, and God steps in. He sends his son, Jesus, into the world to live the life that we should have lived. He took, he took his life, and he lived completely obedient to the Father, Matthew 5, 48. He says, be perfect, for your heavenly Father is perfect. The only one who's ever done that is Jesus, the second Adam. Your first representative brought unrighteousness to this world. Your second representative offers life and righteousness to you, his righteousness in his life. That's tremendous because it tells you that only Jesus can save you and only by you coming and giving yourself to him can you be saved. God did that for you, offered life in Jesus in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. He died to pay for our sins, pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. All of that wrath that Josh and everybody else was storing up for themselves on the day of judgment, all of that wrath God poured out on his son for those who would put their faith and trust in him. 
It's all taken away. And guess what? The resurrection shows he is worthy. Resurrection shows that he paid it in full and that payment was accepted and that we, if we desire eternal life, don't just say, hey, that happened, amen. We say, that happened? You're offering me grace even in the sinful condition that I'm in? Well, then I will come and I will put my faith and my trust in you as who you are, Lord, who created me for your glory and as Savior. I come back so that I'll be whoever you created me to be. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing and we look like we're bored over it. It's, a, it's amazing. That's why we're singing Amazing Grace. He came after us. And he says, you can't even, he, you can't, you're like that horse who won't stop pursuing yourself until the master comes and says, hey, move, turn around. John 6, 44. No one, Jesus says, can come to me and, and receive salvation. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And then he says, then I will raise them up on the last day. You can't come to him without him even tapping you on the shoulder. And so where I was before I came to faith in Christ, dead in my transgressions and sins, I started hearing the Savior's voice. He started making me alive. He started giving me eyes to see and ears to hear. I was not quite alive yet, but I was starting to have life, and I was starting to see what God has done for me, and I was refusing to come like that horse saw his master. What do you want? What do you want? Feed, feed, feed. What do you want? Feed, feed. The master started getting even more pressure putting on this horse. Get out, Samson. And finally Samson said, I better listen to the master unless I want to get him kick me back. God did that for us. How does he do it? Through the word of God and through the spirit. Stop right now. Even if you were saved at an early age, how did you get saved? No one's saved apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nobody. How did you get saved? Word of God came to you, whether you were in a cradle and started growing up and the Word of God was coming to you, someone was speaking God's Word over you, and the Spirit of God gave you life. The natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit, the Bible says. Guys, it's all God. It's all His grace. He came after me. He spoke, it's like, Z kills dry bones, right? These dry bones, he says, can these bones live? And he says, God, you know. And he says, I'll tell you what, prophesy. Speak the word over these bones. As he speaks the word of the bones, the bones start coming together and rattling. This army begins to stand up, right? The sinews, the flesh, all of the muscles, the ligaments start coming together. It starts taking the form of, uh, of an army. But he says it doesn't have life yet. You've got you to prophesy to the winds, and the wind will come and fill it with life. Folks, before I came to Jesus, that's where I was. God gave me the word of God. I heard the gospel 150 times in my life. I started hearing my Savior's voice. I started listening. I started saying, no, but I'm not coming. No, but I'm not coming. I was like that army, the bones rattling, right? The flesh coming together. I had a head knowledge of the gospel at this point, but my heart has not surrendered to the Lord yet. And it wasn't until I turned to him and said, okay, forgive me, save me, I'm yours. That's when he filled me with the breath filled me with the Holy Spirit, and I was alive again. And folks, I guarantee you there's someone in this room who has lived your entire life where I was, thinking you got it because you know the stuff, but you have failed to turn to him to be saved. He'll save anyone and everyone who turns to him to put their faith and trust wholly in the finished work of Jesus on that cross. But if you don't turn to him to come, he is saving no one who does not come to him and we got to get that in our minds. Church people are going to perish. Not believers. He's not saving perfect people, but he's not saving anyone who's refusing to come to him either. So we got to get that in our hearts. He came after us. He breathed life into us. When we turn and put our faith and trust in him, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. You didn't work yourself back to heaven. You didn't say, okay, I hear your voice now. I'm going to start doing this, God. I know you're saying do this, but I'm going to do this good deed, this good deed, this good deed, this good deed. See, I'm kind of on the same page as you. I sing up here. Who am I? Right? I mean, I, I sing up here. Hey, I teach Sunday school up here. Yeah, I'm going to do this, not come to you. I'm not going to give you my heart. I do this, 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 and this. He says, come to me. I determine what you do. Whoo. Come on, y'all. This is not, I promise you, for entertainment. I am not trying to entertain anyone. I'm trying to wake us up by preaching the word to you and I pray that the Spirit of God is moving in your heart. If that don't give you a passion, 
to serve God, I don't know what will. He says, you've been saved by grace, not of yourselves, as a gift of God, not from works, lest any man should boast. It's nothing you do. You don't bring anything to the table. Only trust in Jesus. In verse 10, it says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that you would walk in them. God saved you, set you apart, gave you new life, gave you a circumcised heart, which means that he has given you a new heart and a new spirit in Christ, and he's marked you as his own. And John tells you again, right? Those who are mine, those who are God's, actually start following the Lord. That stubborn horse walked away, and he didn't follow that master completely, perfectly, but he did go in the same direction the master was saying, go. He didn't do it with a good attitude either. <laughs> For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. When we, wonder, when we understand where we were and we understand what God did, there's that terrible backdrop of the black velvet, then the guy puts the jewels on the table and says, look how beautiful those jewels are once you've seen that backdrop. Now do you want to buy it? And anyone who's seen that for what it is will come running and say, God, not only this, not only will you save me, not only do I want your salvation and your forgiveness because it's free and it's wonderful and it's awesome. I can have life in Christ Jesus. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Not only that, God, but you're saving me to, re to restore me to what you originally created me to be. Think back to Adam and Eve. You're supposed to love the Lord your God. You're supposed to glorify him in what you do. You're supposed to love, serve, worship him, and follow him and allow him to lead you and not out, act outside of his rule. So if you have been saved in this room, God's purpose for you is to glorify God with your life because of what he's done for you. Is that not true? Let's watch this. He didn't just save you to good works. Now that I saved you, pick whatever you want to do in life and go do it. No, now that I've saved you, you are my artwork, my masterpiece. You're the canvas who has... Put yourself into my hands for me to start working on to be what I intended you to be from the very beginning. Does that make sense? Put your hand, man in the hand, hand of whatever. <laughs> Put your hand in the man, in the hand of a man. Something like that. Put your canvas in his hands. Put yourself in his hands as the potter and the clay. And don't fight against it. By your flesh. Walk by the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Let Him paint you and make you who He originally intended you to be. Because when He said that He came to make a new creation, that included us. It's not a ticket out of hell, y'all. He's restoring mankind. And there will be no one who dwells in eternity with God who refuses to live for God. Only those who have been redeemed. Only those who have turned to him and said, I need your grace, I need your mercy, I need your forgiveness. Come with me and I'll make you a worshiper. I have set you apart. I have chosen you. I have called you to myself. And I am now conforming you into the image of Christ. That's the beauty that he's making you. He's making you the image of Christ. So don't fight against it. Allow him to use you for his glory, which he prepared in advance for you to do. So a lot of times I spend my life going, God, this is what Josh wants. And God, you prepared before the foundation of the world this for me to do with my life. No, but Josh wants to be a school teacher. No, but Josh wants to do this or Josh wants to do that. God says, I, and he's been spending a long time preparing me, I have this for you to do. So the battle is this, fight against what Josh wants. God, is this your will? Walk in it. God, is this your will? Walk in it. God, is this your will? Walk in it. And as we do that, he prunes that old stuff off. He takes that excess clay off and he makes you who he's intended you to be from the very beginning and it will have nothing to do with, it will not be opposite of what any of this book says. It won't. So read the word of God. Get grounded, get rooted in Christ. Say, God, you saved me. I'm yours. I'm not my own. I was bought at a price. Amen? Do with me what you will. Whatever that looks like, I'm in. Please help me to fight against it. And he has given you everything that you need to not fight against it. He has given me everything that, that, that I need for life and for godliness. He has created you for a purpose to think back of what he's done for you. His love given to you ought to stir your love for him. I go back to that same song. I've tried to write down the lyrics because this is what had me in tears, not because it was just a beautiful song because there are a lot of beautiful country songs I get teary-eyed to. 
You're our creator, our life sustainer, deliverer, our comfort, our joy. Throughout the ages, you've been our shelter, our peace in the midst of the storm. With signs and wonders, you've shown your power. With precious blood, you've shown us your grace. You've been our helper, our liberator, the giver of life without end. When we walk through life's darkest valleys, when we'll, we will look back at all you have done, and we will shout, our God is good, and he is the faithful one. And then he says, I still remember. That's my favorite part. He gets choked up in it. He said, let me see if I can get finished with this. I still remember the day you saved me, the day I heard you call out my name as I was that stubborn horse, right? Whew, you said you loved me, would never leave me, and I've never been the same. We will remember, we will remember, we will remember the work of your hands, and we will stop and give you praise. <sighs> Great is your faithfulness. That's why Paul says, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves to God a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. That's your spiritual act of worship. Just give yourself back to God because he came to get you. Amen? Amen. And as you give yourself to him, he'll have his will, his way in your life. And I promise you, your joy will be complete as you follow him. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what you're struggling with. I do know this, that I had a lot of buddies right along that road with me who said, yeah, we're Christians, man. It's all good, brother. He saves us by grace. As long as we go to church every once in a while, as long as we read that every once in a while, as long as we say a prayer every single night before we go to bed, we're all good. All those are fine and dandy. But is your heart, is your heart given to the Lord? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus today? Give him your heart. Give him your life. He'll save you. He'll set you free. He'll forgive you for everything you've ever done. He'll give you a new life and a spirit and begin to call you to walk in the ways which he prepared in advance for you to be. Let's not fight against it, church. Let's remember what he's done and let's live for him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you again for this wonderful opportunity that we have to remember, God, what you've done for us. And this isn't just man's words. This is so clear in this text of Scripture and not just in this text, but all throughout the New Testament and all throughout the Old Testament. As we see God, just failure after failure after failure in the Old Testament of us not being able to walk in your ways. And we see that promise of hope that's slow and steady throughout the Old Testament that points towards our Savior, the Messiah, Jesus. No one can do it, so you did it for us. And the Lord came to save his people. His people hear his voice. Your people hear your voice. And they come to you to be forgiven, to be set free, and to experience new life. God, we don't want Adam to represent us. We want you to represent us. And so we stop fighting against that, and we come to you by faith. I pray that you'll save a sinner today. I pray that you'll continue to sanctify the other sinners who are putting their faith and trust in you, who you call saints only by your grace. We love you and we praise you. Have your will in your way during this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.